When you go to the shop to buy some milk, your mind starts processing the criteria for making a decision. How close the shop is, whether I'm satisfied with the quality of the milk, the price, the expiry date. It's a normal process, you don't want to bring your family expired milk, especially if it's a mile walk and the rude cashiers are going to snap at you. But what if I told you that exactly the same criteria processes are triggered if we're talking about a country to live in? Am I suited to the climate, the quality of food, the cost of housing, the level of education for children, the availability of friends and acquaintances, career opportunities, financial security, safety on the streets, the architecture of the city, the local way of life, the judicial system, the attitude of the police, the possibility of travel? Yes, at first it seems a little more complicated than buying milk at the nearest shop next door to your home, but the pattern is the same. Just as there are criteria for choosing between shopping at Walmart or 7-Eleven, so there are criteria for choosing between countries, if not for a permanent residence, then at least for a temporary stay. Of course, the ideal country exists only in fantasy. The criteria cannot all be cranked out to the max. Moreover, they are subjective in their value. Someone generally cannot imagine their life without regular meetings with school friends on the weekend, for someone else, career is the most important thing, the third is more interested in the education of their children, and a fourth just takes pleasure looking at the bass reliefs. Each to their own, so to speak. This video focuses on a phenomenon that is very acute in the new realities of Russia. It needs to be taken into account both by ordinary citizens who have not yet realized their opportunities, and by states which have not yet realized their risks. We're talking about interstate competition for people. To give you an idea of how sensitive the subject is, here is how Vladimir Putin once explained why brains are drained from Russia. You and I know this, though maybe not all of us. So-called foreign foundations are working on schools. These network organizations have simply been sniffing around schools in the Russian Federation for many years, under the guise of supporting talented young people. In reality, they suck them up like a vacuum cleaner, and that's it. They take applicants straight from school, hook them on grants, and take them away. By the way, this is a perfect example of the clinical inability to admit one's mistakes. According to their logic, young people are leaving Russia not because the current environment and conditions are uncompetitive and there are simply more prospects elsewhere, but because some third-party actors are sniffing around schools, sucking out brains like a vacuum cleaner and getting people hooked on fat grants as if it was cocaine. It could take us another 10 minutes of linguistic parsing of the words sniffing, vacuuming and hook on to understand what is going on in people's heads. But the bottom line is that the reasons for the brain drain are not because of the current situation here in Russia, but because of these, the mugger agents who are corrupting the youth. Nevertheless, the brain drain as a problem has been identified, albeit with a twisted reason. Of our time, a more human speech could be heard from Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin when he got really emotional about the impulsive relocation by the IT people. You know, I don't really believe that everyone will leave. I would like to take this opportunity to address you guys. Developers, IT people, let's make our own ecosystem. We have everything we need to do this. I am turning to you and I want to say that the motherland has made all the work opportunities available to you. Don't be afraid of anything. Don't trust anyone. Everything will be fine here, and you will be able to work reliably and calmly for your country, for your company, to earn properly and to live comfortably here. Mishustin did not beg IT folks to stay just because. It is true that many have indeed left, although to be honest it's hard to get specific figures of how many have actually left, how many have returned, and what qualifications these people have. Well, for example, the FSB, the nowadays KGB that is, 
reported that about 4 million people left the country. It's like about 7% of the workforce, and it's a million more than last year. But if we look at the previous years, it all becomes ridiculous, because before the pandemic it used to be 8 million at times, and everything was alright, a lot of people will be back for sure. The very same Mishustin and Maksud Shadeyev, the Minister of Digital Development, said that they had managed to track via SIM cards that under 85% of people already returned. Hearing such a statement, one could only wonder whether the digital concentration camps are already here, or whether the real figure is simply unknown to anyone. In general, such a method is very vague. Well, maybe the fellow who relocated came back to get their cat, or loved ones, or just to see their close relatives. Anyway, as you can see, there are too many buts. But we tried. It took a lot of effort to get some numbers. I mean, if you just go to the Federal Statistics website, type in the countries that are potential for emigration, those, by the way, are the neighboring countries that are relatively loyal to Russia, and the ones you might not have even heard of, you get this graph. Look at this. Some identical lines, shit's unclear, but everything is stable. You can see only a drop in 2020 because of the COVID. No one was flying anywhere. Yeah, awesome. Very useful for our video. But if we start digging deeper, taking only the first quarters as a comparison, you can find that a record 134,000 people indeed hauled their asses to Armenia and 53,000 to Uzbekistan. Although again, if we compare it with 2019, the situation is not all that catastrophic. But at the same time, we cannot ignore it. Because it is unknown how the pandemic has affected the structure and purposes of these trips. I mean, 114,000 people travelled to Armenia in early 2020. Are these still the same people, with the same goals, who left in early 2022? Yes, abnormal surges certainly take place. Moreover, if we take the statistics for the purpose of trips, the business trips record growth up to 4,000 flights. Situation in Georgia is hilarious, even. If in other countries the decline of business trips was only in 2020 and not even up to zero, in Georgia, literally for the whole first quarter of 2020, there were 21 people. In 2021, 33 people. But for some reason in 2022, our 1,250 citizens have found out about some business there in Georgia. Or if you take the purpose for the trip as work, in early 2022 the Russians have suddenly found themselves flying to the United Arab Emirates for work. Same goes for Georgia as well for that matter. Though we will not go into the reasons why people are leaving, everybody understands everything. There is another thing that is far more interesting. How other countries decided to use the opportunity to grab Russian brains during its train. Armenia Many have moved there because of the convenience, friendliness to Russia, the prevalence of the Russian language, the low cost of living and close proximity to homeland. Therefore, between the impossibility to conduct business from the territory of the Russian Federation or to move to a neighbouring country mimicking an Armenian, people chose the latter. This is understandable. But I just want to draw your attention to the fact that in conditions when Russia began to shake and specialists began to look abroad, Armenia introduced a special feature for the IT sector. The state compensates half of the personal income tax. Of course, it is not all that simple. There are conditions such as 50 new job positions have to be created. But nevertheless, if you want to get such a nice bonus, you just might do it too. Entire countries are now losing their status as the sacred realm of the homeland. East or West, home is best. The sacred duty to one's country and all that pretentious, abstract, elusive and manipulative stuff, countries now look more and more like a potential employer in a job competition. And countries are becoming more and more like corporations. If you don't like Apple, you just choose Samsung instead. 
Some even clearly state that here they have a shortage of such and such people and they need exactly that many people. Armenia lacks 4,000 IT specialists. The shortage of staff leads to projects that could have been implemented in Armenia going to other countries. Specialists arriving in Armenia today can partially fill the gaps, but many come with their own companies, so there is still a shortage. Judging from the fact that NVIDIA has opened its research center in Armenia, some progress in closing the gaps is being made. By the way, there was speculation that the opening of that center somehow oddly coincided with the start of the war, but here the company says that they are out of politics, though they have actually decided to exit the Russian market in the end. Right, whatever. Let's move on to a much brighter example, a country that has prepared itself for a job fair in order to present itself in its best light to potential employees. You may be surprised about what country that is, since you may have never associated this country with an IT hub. In fact, you may never have even heard of it before. After all, it is… Uzbekistan. Since 2019, Uzbekistan has been running an IT park, a special area with special infrastructure and tax conditions that support residents. This kind of like Silicon Valley, but with the RTX off. To give you an example, these are the conditions in the usual case all over the country. And these are the conditions for the residents of the IT park. Then, the day after the war starts, they roll out the Tash Rush program, in which the park administration helps with hands-on assistance and advice with relocation, not only for the workers, but also for their families. They help with visas, airport transfers, accommodation even with kindergarten. So, on the one hand, they have organized the conditions for you in the new place, and on the other, they provided hand-holding help to pull you out of your old conditions and organize the smooth transition. And it works. If for the whole of 2021 the share of foreign IT companies in the park was 4%, in January-May period the number has almost tripled to 12%. It's worth mentioning, though, they developed all these features before the war. Afterwards, whether it's related or not, I don't know, but in April they came up with a special visa for relocated IT people. They say it took about two weeks from the initiative to the signing of the decree. It's called, as simply as it is, an IT visa. Now, you may wonder what kind of visa this is, because usually there is a work visa, but this, this is some kind of IT visa. A special one. As of April the 1st of 2022, there is such a thing for obtaining a residence permit. If before, in order to get a residence permit, you had to buy property worth $400,000, it was given a slight reduction, only 400 times. Yes, it is enough for IT specialists to buy I do not even know what, a, a garage for $1,000 and that's it. The residence permit for Uzbekistan is there in their pocket. Yeah, if someone would have told me at the beginning of the year that a Russian would need Uzbekistan visa to keep in touch with the world. It is available not only for IT people though, but also for these three categories of people, including investors and businessmen. And to underline the degree of globalization and obsolescence of sacred traditions, I will point out that the idea of creating such a park emerged when the president of Uzbekistan visited India in 2018. And again, here at the level of the government, it is stated how many IT specialists they need, up to 12,000 people. We will now finish with Uzbekistan and move on to the next country, which is on the verge of historical change. Literally, we will even make a separate chapter for this one. There is one small but very technologically and medically advanced country in the world that has no migration policy at all. That is, you cannot get a residence permit with your fat wallet, you cannot get it for any special skills. One can be a tourist for 90 days, but then you have to leave the territory of the country until next year. Israel 
Only repatriates. החזר למולדת. In other words, those who have confirmed their Jewish roots are allowed to stay longer than 90 days. But on February the 24th, the world has changed, and the sacred rules that have been in effect in Israel for hundreds of millions of years have been slightly revised. First of all, the process of the repatriation program was sped up from a year to four days, and some paperwork requirements were cancelled. They have simplified it even to the point, and I find it hard to believe that you can just take all the documents and prove that you are Jewish right at the airport. But one our Russian viewer who lives there says so. Here you can press pause and read the nuances of how you are met at the airport and even given shekels for starters. Maybe you will come to realize that you are in fact Jewish as well, like many Russians today. And it is true. The website of the Eli Gelvitz Bar Association, for example, shared some statistics. In January, the site was visited by 2,800 people, in February by 22,000 people, and in March by 58,000. But that's still child's play. So far, we've only talked about simplifying the existing rules. The revolutionary thing is that they have added the right to relocate employees of IT companies, even those without Jewish roots. Yes, there is a 90-day period only for the time being, with the possibility of extension, but nevertheless, there used to be no such thing at all. The tectonic plates of sacred dogma have shifted. But here the surprises, at least mine personally, do not end. You know who lobbied for this decision? This girl right here. What do you think is so unusual about it? She's from Russia, named Sofia Tupoleva. Together with Daniel Chernov, they founded Reboot Startup Nation, a non-profit organization in Tel Aviv where almost all the employees are of Russian or Ukrainian descent. So then they got their hands on this guy, a member of the local parliament, so that the two of them could broadcast to the whole parliament with the message, let's help IT people accommodate for work in our country since we have a staff shortage. And this is how Reboot Startup Nation became a pilot partner in the Fast Track program, the conditions of which we have already shown you before. So far, it is all aimed at those who are already working for Israeli companies. But in the second phase, they want to include those who are just looking for a job on Israeli soil. Obviously, only the super competent people will be targeted, and there will definitely be dragging with those who don't have Jewish roots, but the ice has broken. Sophia, Daniel, you have set a historical precedent. Good luck to you. Surely, Russia, looking at all the mess with the brain drain, is also taking steps. There are people in the country who understand that the economy is not just about selling black honey from the bowels of the earth. The division between digital leaders and users is taking place before our eyes. And we should, of course, seize the opportunity to take the lead in the new environment, to develop and implement digital transformation projects. High-quality people in this field are important. Those who are able to create new technologies and work with them, we have many such people. Therefore, the following has been done. They have introduced a register of accredited IT companies, in other words, a list of companies with privileges. The list of IT companies even somehow includes the Russian Postal Service. Bonuses are received both by the companies themselves in the form of reduced and in fact considerably reduced taxes, here they are on screen. And the employees of the companies on the register receive bonuses too. For example, they won't be drafted into the army. That's a great bonus, especially in the current climate. Then a preferential mortgage, and it's much more attractive than that of COVID times. They give it at a sweet 5%, when normally the average mortgage rate is up to 9%. However, with the central bank lowering the key rate, it may also lower the interest rate on preferential mortgages. But there is a catch. 
It is clear that they want to keep an IT person on Russian soil, so a contract might contain this line. That is, if you take out a mortgage while working for Russian Post and then go to work for some other company outside the register of accredited IT companies, for example some Google, and even if you stay in Russia you will be charged in full, and the interest rate will increase up to 9%. They're going to shit on you hard. All in all, the option is not bad. But be sure that all these 5, 10 or 30 years the Russian IT specialist will work for only accredited companies in Russia. Well, besides retaining old professionals, just recently the State Duma passed a bill to simplify the procedure of getting a residence permit for IT specialists from abroad, apparently guided by the Israeli experience. After all, the simplified procedure is not simply for the sake of it, but to attract people to work in those accredited companies. What I have told you is not a recent phenomenon. The trend for thorough selection of qualified personnel began when brainwork became more expensive than handwork. It's just that there are surges throughout the trend. One was the coronavirus, which accelerated digitalization. It was then the war that suddenly made thousands of people realize that life is not just about one country. And we've all heard of work visas at some point, the long-standing talent visa or, more recently, the digital nomad visa. People are the new oil. This thesis can be understood in different ways, in terms of parasitism or in terms of development. The unit of consumption is a human being. And what are we doing to ensure that human life expectancy increases? What are we doing to ensure that fewer people die in road accidents? I mean, the unit of consumption is a human. How do we treat human life? In the 21st century, the human resource is the most important resource. Not even natural resources, but human resources. That is why I think that geopolitics is becoming obsolete. Natural resources such as iron and nickel are already being tried to be extracted in space. They wanted to launch the mission already in August of this year, but it got delayed. States are beginning to realize that they no longer have a sacred right to the fate of man. A man's skills are becoming more important than his nationality. And now let me quote myself from seven years ago. It is no secret that with the development of telecommunications over the past 50 years, a global economic system has taken shape. In addition to the instant transmission of information around the world, the possibility of remote financial transactions has also opened up. Under these conditions, a new model of competition, the interstate competition, is emerging. Nowadays, the level of development of a state is determined by the established business environment within the country. The current situation requires a radical change in the vision of public administration, addressing successful global models and giving priority to people of intellectual labor and creating the conditions for their realization. I wrote these lines in 2015 while working on an essay, even before our Russian channel, let alone English one, was born. The trend was already visible back then, and unfortunately, since then, foreign investment in the country has fallen to the level of 1994. Well, that's data for 2020. How do you estimate foreign investment in 2022? The main thing to understand is that tomorrow, everyone on the planet will not switch to green energy and mining in space, and the day after tomorrow, Russia will not slide into the Middle Ages, the brightest minds will not run away from the country, and only Bandar logs will be left. These processes have been going on for years. They began about 30 years ago, and recent events have simply accelerated them. A person today is not seen as a citizen of a divine state, but as a carrier of competences for the world market. And the most successful citizens and states will be those who understand this first. Now I would like to give thanks to our supporters on Patreon. 
Thank you for staying with us this whole time. You know who to share this video with. And I'm the researcher.